So writing multi-threaded programs is essential to build high performance applications, but to ensure correctness, we need to lock the critical section. Wrapping the critical section with locks is the most common way to ensure correctness, but it, but it reduces the throughput of your system. So can we do it without locks in this video? With hands-on examples, we'll understand what optimistic locking is, how to use it, what makes it different and more performant than pessimistic locking, when to use it, and most interestingly, how it is internally implemented. So here I'm using a cloud-based IDE called Replit to code this out. Because it is cloud-based, I do not have to set up anything locally and I just need a browser to get started. Replit has an amazing LLM assistant named Ghostwriter, which is extremely powerful because it is vertically trained on programming and software development knowledge base. And the best part is it spits out answers and suggestions in the context of the code that you are writing. Apart from this, Replit has something called as bounties, which can help you make some money on the side. As a bounty, companies post paid projects on web applications, AI tools, Discord bots, and so much more. You can pick the one that interests you, complete it, and get paid. Just sign up on Replit with my link in the description down below. Once you sign up on the home page itself, you can see a section called bounties. When you click on explore, you can see the projects that are listed there and the amount of money you can make out of that. Pick the one that interests you, apply for it, and just get started. So the link for the sign up is in the description down below. Go through that, sign up from my link. And this, to be honest, is a great way to make some money on the site, doing what you love. So do check that out. So now let's head back to the video. So the most common way to ensure correctness while writing multi-threaded program is pessimistic locking, wherein you wrap your critical section with acquisition of lock and release of lock. So when you have n threads who want to execute in the critical section, only one thread is allowed to move in which can execute the critical section while everyone else keeps waiting. Only the thread that is executing the critical section once it releases the lock, then one of the thread which was waiting is allowed to move in. This ensures that in this critical section, only one of the thread is active at a given time and is executing. This ensures correctness. But now you can clearly see how this could become a choke point. Now imagine you are having a severely high uh, multi-threaded program, which is all trying to execute the same critical section. All of them trying to execute the same critical section. Only one of them is succeeding while others keep waiting. So although you would want to leverage high number of cores, but this one choke point is severely affecting the throughput of your system. This is where optimistic locking comes in. So the core idea, the core intuition behind optimistic locking, it's really simple. If there are two threads who are trying to do some operation at the same time, somehow make one thread succeed and other thread fail. So if I have two threads T1 and T2, what if the operation that they are doing, one of operation of one of the thread is successful while the other one does not take any effect and you get to know that it failed. And then you have control to do whatever you want to do with it, right? We'll take an example and then we come back and look at advantages and disadvantages of it. So the way it is implemented is with a very simple semantic called compare and span, right? We'll look at this and then come back to advantages and disadvantages. It would be, it would be very natural flow. So the compare and swap semantic says that, let's say if I have a variable called count, and I want to change the value of count to new value. So I would write count equal to new value. If I have two threads, one of them wants to set count to 11, other thread to set the count of that value to 15. Now, if both of them come at the same time, how do you know which one came first, which one came second? You would take locks and all to do it, right? That's pessimistic way of doing it. But what optimistic approach says is, you would want one of the operation to succeed while other operation to fail. How would you do that? With compare and swap semantic, it says that you set the value of count to new value only if the current value is old value. So uh, on a high level, a pseudo code of it looks something like this. If count equal to equal to 10, then you set count equal to 11. Otherwise don't set it. Right. Now, similarly, if you have two threads, one wants to set 11, it would fire compare and swap count comma 10 comma 11 
and another thread who wants to set it to 15 would do compare and swap count 10 comma 15. If you look carefully when these two threads execute at the exact same time what would happen one of them would succeed because the current value is 10 one of them let's say thread t1 came first it executed so then this 10 became 11 but when t2 came in the current value is 11 so this compare and swap statement would fail so it's compare and swap count 10 equal 10 comma 15 it would fail now it's under your control on what you need to do if it fails that's the beauty of optimistic locking that you have an option to handle the failures however you like if you'd want to retry retry if you'd want to ignore ignore if you want to throw error to your users throw error to your users it's totally up to you right but this is the whole idea behind optimistic locking but if you look carefully you'd say but this is still not foolproof what if two threads did this there is still contention there's still bunch of code that needs to be executed no Compare and swap operation, understand this, compare and swap operation is atomic in nature. Which means when this compare and swap is running, no other, like the, your CPU will not be context switching at all. That's the whole idea. It's an instruction that is running, that has one to one correspondence when it's running on, like, sorry, when the instruction is executing, your CPU will not, your OS cannot context switch. OS context switch is once the current instruction execution is complete, right? That's the whole idea. So when we talk about internals, you'll get to know why it is atomic and how it is atomic and how it is implemented. <clears throat> so let's take an, uh, before this, let's jump into advantages and disadvantages of it. So here we can see that what we are trying to do with optimistic locking is that here we are allowing n threads, all the threads to execute the statement, but only one of them succeeds while other fail or other has no impact or no effect whatsoever. So, in a system where there are rare conflicts and fewer contentions, optimistic locking gives you better throughput than pessimistic locking. Because pessimistic locking is being negative and it wants no matter what your threads wait for other thread to complete. Right? Whoever is wants to impact or whoever wants to execute the critical section. Right? Which is where the problem is. It reduces the throughput. But if your contentions are fewer and your conflicts are rare, this would be much better choice. Second is there is very low locking over it because compare and swap does not require any fancy thing. It just requires under support from underlying architecture, underlying CPU. If it's there, it's very lightweight. Third is we get to pick how we want to resolve conflicts because in pessimistic locking, because it is a, it is a sequential execution in the critical section, there the chances of conflicts if you write good code are zero, right? So there it would happen one after another. So here with optimistic locking, you know that this fails, so it's up to you. You'd want to retry, you'd want to ignore, you'd want to throw error. It's totally up to you. So you can devise a very fine grained experience around contentions. But disadvantages are the implementation is not trivial. When we look at the code, we'll see how it's not so um, intuitive to write code for optimistic locking, but it's essential if you'd want to go for it for a better throughput. And it's not meant for all use cases. There are some use cases for which you cannot use optimistic locking. There are most use cases where you can okay, occasionally use optimistic locking, but you need to know that there is no one golden solution in computer science. There's always trade-offs. You get some, you lose some. So understand where you can use optimistic locking and when you cannot. So in a simple example where you can do compare and swap, optimistic locking just works because you have native CPU support. Otherwise, if you are doing bunch of stuff, let's say making call to database, doing this, doing that, whatnot, if it's big enough thing, it's better to take pessimistic locking. If you're doing far too many things there. <coughs> Sorry. So now let's take a quick example at demonstration of optimistic locking. And we'll see how it is implemented. And that's where the fun part is. Now, first, let's talk about the implementation, how it is implemented. Here it's a very simple C code on what we are, and by the way, you will find equivalent of this in any programming language you write. For example, in Java also you have it, Golang has sync atomic package. So look out for atomic packages and that's where you would find, uh, like that's what you need to use when you're using optimistic locking. Okay. But the idea is, look at this very simple example. Here what we are trying to do is we're trying to create two threads. Both the threads, when they spin up, they execute the function increment count, which is this. And we wait for both of the threads to complete. What this increment count does? 
it just does count plus plus. But instead of just writing, if it was pessimistic locking, you could just take mutex, do count plus plus and release the mutex. Right? But now because you are doing optimistic locking, now see you have to do so much, you have to write so much code. So what we are doing first, we are first atomically loading the value of the count variable. First thing, we are storing it in old value. So you read the old value. Then you compute the new value, which is old value plus one. And then you do an atomic compare and exchange of count old value and new value, which means that internally the way it is implemented, it would be doing count equal to new value only if the current value is old value. If it is not true and this would return true or false. If it is true, which means it was successful in doing it, which means there was no contention while this command executed. So all good. But if it was contention, it would have returned false and which means your increment failed. Now it's up to us on what we need to do. We could here recursively invoke this increment count function if we want to. It would keep on going until it succeeds. Or we could just throw the same error back to the user that hey, we could not increment the count. Or we could just ignore and say leave it as is. Right. But now you see how the code that would have been simple with mutexes become very verbose when it came to optimistic logging. Right. And that's what the fun is. And that's why you could see that it would not suit all use cases. You need to figure out where to use optimistic logging, where to use pessimistic logging. Right. But yeah, this replit, I use it very often. I put it link, I put the link in the description down below. Check that out, fork it, play with it. Quite fun to play with optimistic logging. Now let's go deeper and see how it is implemented. So for us to know how it is implemented, we'll peek into this, the assembly language code that this generates. So GCC hyphen capital S main dot C. <coughs> Sorry, this would create the file main dot S, which contains the assembly code. This is the assembly language code of my corresponding C code that we just wrote, this code. Here, the magic happens here. You could see p thread create p thread join. This is the main function that we wrote. See, this is the main function that we wrote increment count p thread create p thread create. We are passing it. But what happens in p thread create? This is what happens. This is what our increment count looks like as a function. Now, here you can see an instruction which is this. Look at this it's cmpxchgl. It's compare exchange L is for long lock means it is atomic instruction. So when this instruction is happening, your CPU will not context switch. And here it takes arguments and whatnot will not go deeper into assembly language code, but you get the idea of what's happening. This is the instruction that is doing that magic. Now here, the thing is this instruction is going to be executed on the underlying hardware. So your underlying hardware needs to support or needs to expose an instruction like this for you to leverage, com le leverage compare and swap. Otherwise you could not. Otherwise a lot of implementations of compare and swap in case your CPU does not support the instruction compare and exchange is using mutexes. So you're actually using pessimistic clocking to implement optimistic clocking in case your CPU does not support it. But if your CPU supports it, which in today's day and age, most CPU does, then it translates to directly one CPU instruction CMPXCHGL and this is the magical instruction that does exactly what the function does is it sets the value only if the current value is what we passed. So old count, old value, new value is almost very similar to the semantic that your CPU instruction expects. And this is what makes it atomic because it's you are leveraging the underlying CPU to ensure that your program does not context switch. You're using that instruction that is given to you by CPU, which guarantees that your context switch will never happen when, because instructions are executed in an atomic fashion, this instruction will be executed in an atomic fashion. This is what your CPU is ensuring. So leveraging the underlying stuff is what would give you that superpower to build a very, to have an efficient optimistic locking implementation. So few things just to summarize, that your underlying architecture and compiler needs to support that whatever assembly language or bytecode it generates, it leverages the underlying CPU. So if it, if your compiler or your CPU architecture does not give you the ability, then internally it will be implementing. It would have atomic package, but it will be using pessimistic locking to implement it. Otherwise, if it supports, then great. It can directly translate into the corresponding CPU instruction directly. 
but although that's a worst case you would anyway it's it would still be a win win but you could just model it in a different way right but uh, peek into the internals of source code to understand how it is it's quite fun and quite interesting go through <coughs> just look out for just google search cnpx chgl cnpx chgl yes uh, so just just google that instruction and see what it does you'll you'll discover something new right but yeah this is how this is what optimistic locking is Right. There is no one way to implement it, but you get the overall idea of optimistic locking where you try to build it such a way that in an atomic fashion, two things are executing, one of them succeeds, other one fails. You capture the failed one and see what you want to do with that. Optimistic locking in case of database, exactly the same. Optimistic locking in case of multi-threaded applications like this, exactly the same. The concept still remains the same. Implementation could vary depending on the situation. Right. But I showed you one of them where you are using threads and how it leverages underlying CPU to do it. Right. But the idea is you need an atomic way to do this update so that you capture one succeeded another failed and voila, you have your own optimistic locking. Right. So just Google search which all systems use optimistic locking and how they do it. It's very fascinating topic. You will stumble upon some really interesting stuff out there and it will and you'll have a time, you'll have a good time exploring them. And yeah. This is all what I wanted to cover in this one. I hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it amusing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, Adam.